Welcome back. I'm developer evangelist Kevin Hoyt. In this series, we've been taking a look at emerging web standards. In this episode, we'll be taking a closer look at CSS3 animations. Now, animations build on our previous episode of transitions. Um, the idea behind animations is to be able to do more than just a single linear movement. You don't want to go from point A to point B. What if you want to go from point A to point B to point C to point D to point E to back to point A? You need to be able to uh, write that uh, and doing it with transitions would require a lot of move it this way, is it done? Okay, move it this way, is it done? Okay, move it this way. Animations gives you a CSS syntax to be able to tell um, elements how to get from point A to point B and how to have many stops in between. So CSS3 animations are a really fun technology to play with. Uh, they're hardware accelerated on, on the iOS devices, so um, that's going to give you really silky smooth animations, uh, depending on the number of objects you're trying to transition, how big they are, and how far you're trying to move them. But generally speaking, it'll give you a nice performance uh, for your animations because it'll be li rely on that uh, hardware acceleration. Uh, again, CSS3 uh, animations are for nonlinear movement. If you want to move something from point A to point B, transition is a good enough way to do that. You don't, you don't need to overkill with animations. Uh, one of the kind of tricky things about animations is that uh, the timing of how it gets, uh, of when it is a point A, B, and C um, is done via percentages of the overall total time that it's going to take to get from point A to point C. So um, the way they denote that is through percentage points. And you'll see this in the code in a minute, uh, but it could be 0% will be the start, 50% would be halfway through this particular animation, 100% would be the end of the animation. Um, and so you have to kind of keep that in mind. It's not quite as clean as if you're familiar with other kind of animation tools and technologies dealing with, you know, oh, well, I want on the uh, 12th uh, segment of this particular second, I want it to do this. On the 13th, I want it to do this. Uh, you don't have quite that clean control over it. Um, it's still very much kind of a percentage-based movement. The things you can animate, um, you can you can give it the animation a name, you can give it a duration, how long it's going to play, you can tell it how, uh, how many times to play it, so you can actually have an iteration property to tell it to repeat itself. Um, you can tell it a direction, which is kind of fun, right? If you want to play it back and then play it uh, backwards, you can give it a direction property, um, and you can even tell it to wait uh, before it moves on in the process. Uh, when you're working with CSS3 animations, and if you're, to, for example, using a debugging tool to look at the uh, DOM uh, elements and the style sheet properties to see what's there, um, you might be familiar with using the document.stylesheets, and then the, that's the array of style sheets that are on the page. So let's say style sheet zero uh, dot rules, which is a property on the style sheet, and that'll give you the rules that are on the style sheet. But those are the rules. In this case, we're actually going to use a CSS directive to point to, to, to specify what our animation is, and it won't show up there for us by uh, on the rules property. So when you're working with the CSS transitions, um, I'm sorry, with CSS animations, you're going to want to look on the CSS rules property off of the style sheet property. From there, you can use find rule, insert rule, delete rule to go ahead and modify and dynamically change any of the properties uh, inside that animation at runtime. Uh, if you want to change them, for example, based on the size of the screen uh, for different tablet resolutions and things like that, you can go ahead and do that. Of course, you might use media queries there as well. Um, the other things to know about uh, animations is that there are events for tracking animations. There's an animation start, an animation end, and an animation iteration. So animation start and animation end are pretty self-explanatory. Animation iteration says, you know what, this has gone on and done its thing, and then it's going to do it again, and now it's going to do it again. And so it picks up every time the iteration occurs if you set up an iteration counter. Um, those events and even the CSS um, application of the animation tends to be a bit browser specific, so you might want to play with it to make sure it works in your target browser. Um, we'll be using Chrome for this, which is a WebKit browser, uh, so we'll be using the WebKit notation for this. Of course, you could include the, mo the, the Moz uh, prefix, the O prefix, and then just, of course, the straight up uh, regular CSS prefix. To save myself time and keystrokes, I'm just going to use the WebKit in this one. Let's dive in and take a look. So as a refresher here, I'm going to go to my browser where we have this little jack scheme that we've been building. And the idea is to bounce the ball off the floor and have it return to us. So going down would be one transition, but coming back up would be another one. And the, things, uh, the thing 
about animations is it lets us do more than one thing at a time. So we can tell it to move down, at, and then at 50% it should be down, and at 100% it should come back up. So that bouncing of the ball is done through a CSS animation versus the throwing of the ball down and letting it sit there, uh, which would be a linear movement, which would be a transition. So there's our, our game. Uh, so far what we've got is we click on the ball and it goes from point A to point B. It's going from one side of the screen to the other side of the screen. What we're gonna do is jump in here and add that capability for it to, to have uh, multiple stops along the way. So let's go over to Dreamweaver and uh, take a look at the code where we left it off from the last episode. Um, the do load goes ahead and gets a reference to the ball on the screen and then it goes ahead and adds the click listener for when we click on the ball. Once we've clicked on the ball, it calls, an event, uh, calls a, a function for us, and it says, hey, move the uh, left side of the ball from here to here. In this case, uh, we no longer, and the reason, well, the reason we did that, first off, was because the CSS transitions would actually uh, watch a specific property that was changing, and then go ahead and transition from point A to point B based on the change of that property. CSS animations um, make assumptions about the properties. In fact, you can specify where it what property should be wh at what value at what point during the animation. So we're not going to worry about watching the individual um, ball and telling it to, to move its point. We're going to tell it to animate. We'll come back to that in a second, but for now I'm just going to go ahead and remove that line that specifies to move the ball to the left. Taking a look at our CSS here, there's a new block in here that wasn't there originally. It's a, C it's a CSS animation directive here for the keyframes. Uh, so this is our animation hook. It says what the animation is, and it can be reused across multiple elements at any given point in time, so it needs a name. That's the next element. We're gonna call this bouncing. Now, at 0% of this animation, or essentially at the start, we're gonna have the ball at the left 100, top 100, so over in the kind of the left-hand area of the screen. At 50%, it will be over uh, left 425, down 500, so down kind of towards the middle, bottom of the screen. And then at 100% of the animation, that ball uh, will be over 850 pixels and down 100 pixels. Now in this case, I've said ball because I know what we're going to apply it to, but you notice that there is no specific um, element that we're applying it to here. And again, that's because these animations can be applied to any element at any point in time, by referring to the name that we've given it, and in this case, that is bouncing. Now, if we come down and look at our ball property, uh, you'll notice that I have it actually hooked up to start at left and top of 100 and 100. There is no, uh, with, with CSS transitions, we had a WebKit transition, a Moz transition, an O transition, and the CSS transition itself um, for the uh, movement, and then it would watch that property, but since we're not watching the property, we don't specify that. And I also want to dynamically tell the ball when to move, that is when it's been clicked on. I can go ahead and put the CSS animation hooks in here right off the bat, uh, and what will happen is right off the bat when the page loads, the animation will start. I don't want that to happen. I want it to be dynamically driven from user interaction. So we'll go ahead and leave this CSS as is. We'll just leave it there, and we'll let the animations um, take over for us when we do the assignment. So let's jump back into the JavaScript then. Look at our ball element here. And on ball, I'm gonna say, hey, you know what, ball uh, style. And I like to use set property here. We're gonna tell it to set WebKit dash animation and We'll tell it to use bouncing. And then we'll tell, uh, we'll tell it the WebKit animation duration. And we'll tell it to do that over two seconds. So now when we click on the ball, we apply that WebKit animation um, name via bouncing, which is the name we gave to our animation in the CSS, and then we say the duration is two seconds, and so over two seconds it should go from here to here to here. If we head on over to our browser and refresh it, click on our ball, da, da, da. There we go. Now we are animating our ball. Now I don't have to worry about telling it how to get from point A to point B specifically, I just tell it where point A and point B and point C are, and it worries about the rest. And at this point you can start applying all kinds of interesting transitions to it, uh, or rather um, 
effects to it. So for example, you might choose to uh, ease it in uh, at different timing functions at different points. Uh, you might choose to change the size of the, the, uh, of the, uh, the div element or any other element that you might be animating. In this case, again, it's an image element that represents a ball. Uh, you might choose to uh, change the opacity in addition to the top and the left or anything else you might normally be able to control via CSS, you can start to animate those properties dynamically. And that really leads itself to some really imaginative uh, opp uh, opportunities for us. So now I've got our ball going from point A to point B and I click on it, so we click on the ball, bounces off the floor and then goes to the other side of the room. The problem with it is that if you've ever thrown a ball in real life, um, it doesn't uh, always stay perfectly round. It doesn't just go boom, boom. It, it goes down, and as it hits, that momentum squishes that rubbery ball, and then it, the, what's left in that pushes the ball back off the floor into whatever direction it's going. So that squish needs to happen. We can't have ourselves with a ball that just stays perfectly round. That doesn't look natural. It kind of looks uh, like it's floating around in space at this point. So what we need to do is to be able to apply uh, some sort of squishing to that. That's actually done through CSS3 transforms. So transforms let you do all kind of interesting things like rotate things, or in our case, scale things. So the scale, we can start, we can start pushing it smaller and slender as it gets to the bottom, and then move it out again as it gets further along. We'll take a look at that in another episode. Until then, I'll be waiting.